Good morning, it is Yusuf, your favourite doctor here once again to discuss the Prescribing Skills Assessment Exam, the PSA. This is a national standardised exam that everyone has to do in their fourth or their fifth year of med school and I'm so glad that I gave this exam the respect that it deserved because it was really hard. It was much harder than I expected and really a lot of the prep for it was quite unusual. It doesn't necessarily mean that the medical knowledge that you've learned can carry over directly to this because a lot of it is about knowing where the information is and basically control effing as fast as you can and being able to just be familiar with the formats of the question. Um, in some universities as well they actually combine the results of your PSA with some of the internal exams as well and you get your mark is based on the average between the two so it is very important that you do well on this um, if your university is not the case for that, then you will get one more shot at it, but it does mean that you are restricted on what you can prescribe within your F1 year. So definitely worth getting this sorted on the first one. So my top tips. First thing is make sure that you use the official resources given on the Prescribing Skills Assessment website. There are a few videos that cover the general format of each question, as well as um, some past papers and there's three on there I would recommend doing all three of them at some point um, it gives you an idea of the difficulty the kind of equivalent difficulty to the actual paper <clears throat> but also they um, really make you aware of the time pressure that's involved with this uh, with this exam you will see some people advising the pass the PSA book I think it's a fantastic prerequisite reading and it does familiarize you with the style and content of the questions and also the kind of information that you need to know for it however the difficulty is not the equivalent to the exam. It's certainly easier in that book than it is on the exam paper. Because it's a national exam and because they're trying to standardize it and um, really gauging the results from the students each year, the pass mark does change year to year and the difficulty changes year to year as well. And you do see them calibrating. Like in the last three, four years, it seems to have alternated between being a very hard paper and a very easy paper with the pass mark adjusting accordingly. Either way, you need to prepare for the worst. Finally, respect the exam. So don't think, oh, it's a national paper, it's standardized, like everyone's got to get through. It is not the case. And I think if I didn't give this the headspace that it uh, that I should have, um, then it could have been uh, a reset situation. So the main resources you need are BNF and Medicines Complete. And you need to become really familiar with these overall. So just Get used to using the online BNF, the desktop version, not the mobile app. Um, get used to searching for what you need quickly. You can, you're just using a normal browser in the exam, so you can use Control F. There's no restrictions on keyboard shortcuts and that kind of thing. Um, and Medicines Complete is basically a copy of the BNF with a slightly different interface. Certain information is easier to find in Medicines Complete, particularly treatment summaries, compared to BNF, where you, you find it's easier to find drugs. Generally, the information is the same. Um, I would recommend, rather than picking one, get used to both and figure out the advantages and disadvantages as you use them. And which sounds stupid, but which typography and formatting is easier on the eyes for you and that you're most able to scan information quickly with, because that's really quite important. Um, there are some good resources as well for looking through interactions on the websites. So I think it's Medicines Complete where you can basically input one drug and it gives you a list of a table of interactions for the other thing and you can then just control F. Um, and also there are a few tables and important things like palliative if you look for dose equivalents of morphine type drugs as well. So some useful pages to learn on the BNF and be familiar with. As I mentioned, palliative care, then poisoning and emergency treatment You've got to remember these buzzwords because sometimes you search for something and because it's not quite phrased in the way that they have on their search engine, it won't come up. So if someone's taken an overdose, don't search overdose, search poisoning or emergency treatment. Uh, vaccines, there's the entire schedule on there so you don't need to memorize that. Um, things like GI infections, so if someone's had food poisoning, um, that's what you want to be looking for. And then there's a few others here as well, so I will give you a chance to look through them in your own time. Someone gets, say, meningitis or whatever, check out the, if it's a notifiable disease and what kind of antibacterials you need for it. Um, notifiable diseases particularly include ones that we're vaccinated against. Um, and then, yeah, antacids for someone with dyspepsia or um, possibly a GI bleed. 
So these are all treatment summary pages that will give you an idea of um, what the first line drug is for each of those things. Unhelpful BNF pages. These are unhelpful sometimes in the content of the page, but also in what it's actually um, what it's called and what you would search for. So if you're looking for someone with depression, remember to search for antidepressants. It won't necessarily come up if you just search the word depression. I think the search results are slightly wider with Medicines Complete than they are with BNF. So if you search depression on Medicines Complete, you're more likely to get antidepressants treatment summary to come up there compared to with BNF. But it's a bit idiosyncratic. You'll need to look on both. So it helps for you to know where it is that you need to find something. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, also contraceptives. So um, contraceptives is under contraceptives, but HRT is under sex hormones. And then stuff about INR, um, that is under oral anticoagulants and not regular anticoagulants. This may all be subject to change as they, as they introduce new versions of the BNF, but just make sure that you are as up to date as you can be. So the exam paper, some tips for that. Make sure to put the dose, route, and frequency all from the drop-down menu. And um, this is the kind of format that you'd need to put it in. Remember, um, it has to be the minimum number of tablets or otherwise you only get half the marks. So um, if it says 90, 90 milligram tablets and it comes in 30, then it, let's say it comes in 30 and 60, then you really want 160 and 130, for example, um, to be the minimum number. There is no way to flag questions on the, uh, on the, the interface, I don't think. So you will have a blank bit of paper just write down the numbers of the questions that you want to go back to, circle them, put in as many details as you can. Remember, patient demographics get the majority of the marks. And if you miss those, it's very easy marks that you could be missing out on. What I don't know for sure is whether with the PSA, if you miss the demographic, whether you lose out on subsequent marks. Either way, get them in, and then it means that even if the actual dose and drug and things are wrong, you still get the, the minimum number of marks there. Bring a physical calculator with you. Um, that will be useful for about um, however many questions there are for the calculation and, and do drug doses. And have a physical BNF as well. There is some information that's available in the physical BNF that is not available in the online one. Um, with the current version, it's page 1264 and 1268. Um, and also page 6 or page 8, I think, is the, um, the table for... Uh, opiates as well as a an example of a fp10 subscription form a uh, prescription form as well <clears throat> so just know what those special pages are if you're not sure just put them into your short-term memory when you get to the paper just write down the name of the or the number of the the pages there or fold over the corner of the the bnf uh, when you get in so things like electrolytes if you're looking for fluids that's kind of what you need to look for and your signature is always your first name, initial, dot, last name. Finally, rem remember when you're prescribing a drug, it has to be the generic name, except for modified release um, opiates, which would be the trade name. Demographics. So you want as many identifiers as possible, name, date of birth, hospital number. And okay, so uh, so this is in the risky that you get no marks for the entire question if you get the demographics wrong. Um, if someone could let me know in the comments whether that is the case for the PSA as well, that would be very useful. Scheduled drugs. So remember to say the total quantity in figures. So you write 26 brackets 26 in words tablets. Um, and then for the root, generally, if it's a drug that needs to be given IV, give it IV. If it's a child, then you can consider whether it would distress the child or whether it's something that is is it so urgent that it needs to be given IV or could you spare the child getting cannulated and uh, give it orally? Analgesia. So if you are needing analgesia too frequently and that's part of the question stem, consider switching to modified release or changing the, the background dose. For oral morph, again, this is the drug name. Um, so oral morphate sulfate, or oral morphine sulfate and specify the strength as well. Um, now, as for how many days do you prescribe it for, there's no right or wrong answer, but um, generally between 14 and 30 days should be about right. If you do it too long and it's a scheduled drug, then it's probably going to be 
considered a bit uh, a bit risky behavior to do that. Some acronyms for you. Well, love acronyms. Patient details. So give three, then check for any p possible reactions. Look, look in this question stem if they are penicillin allergic or have had a previous reaction to it. I think we had one question where someone did have an allergy and the their allergy was kind of hidden in a big block of paragraph text. So look out for that. Um, I think some people got caught out with that. Remember your signature, so F dot last name, or first initial dot last name. C, contraindications. So for bleeding, remember, look out for your anticoagulants and your antiplatelets. Steroids, these are the key side effects of steroids, and that can also come into the contraindications as well. So convenient acronym is the actual word steroids. So stomach ulcers, thin skin, edema, American edema, uh, right and left heart failure, so you avoid steroids and heart failure in general, unless they really have to be given, if it's something like GCA. Um, osteoporosis, infection, diabetes, and Cushing syndrome. Um, also, something to bear in mind is that steroids can cause a uh, non-infective increase in white cell count. There may be a question that has someone's blood profile who's well, but their white cell count is slightly elevated, and it might say which of the drugs that they're on is responsible for this elevation in which case it will be the prednisolone, for example. Don't stop these drugs abruptly. Um, you will induce Addisonian crisis in someone if they've been on long-term high steroids and then you suddenly stop it. And also you can cause an acute confusion with giving steroids too. So some more, another acronym for steroid uh, side effects is Cushingoid. So look out for those as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Next we have NSAIDs, so fortunately someone has come up with some lovely acronyms here. So NSAID, so no urine, systolic dysfunction, so again watch out for heart failure, asthma, indigestion and dyscrasia, uh, which is abnormal platelets. So these are the contraindications for non-steroidal anti-inflammatories too. For antihypertensives, consider if they're already hypotensive, um, if they have bradycardia or if it induces bradycardia, check that that might be the drug which has caused it. Um, a cough is common with ACE inhibitors, in which case you would switch to an ARB, an angiotensin receptor blocker, and uh, renal disturbance as well. ROOT, so this is a nested um, acronym within an acronym. Com consider the immediacy. So I'd mentioned giving IV versus oral, and that depends on um, the time sensitivity and also whether they're a child. Intravenous fluids, so I will discuss that in a moment. Um, B, blood clot prophylaxis. So um, remember, there might be an option for compression stockings, which is kind of the first conservative thing you can do, but avoid that if the patient has something which indicates that they have peripheral arterial disease because you'll make things worse and it is, that is definitely a um, sackable offence, I think. So E for emetics, consider the IV route. If someone's vomiting, they're not going to be able to hold down any kind of oral tablets. And I'll cover that more in a moment, but... In general, we want to give 10 milligrams eight hourly IV if someone has heart failure. That's because cyclozine, that should say cyclozine here. Cyclozine is associated with peripheral edema or, or just worsening edema in general. So if someone has got heart failure, metoclopramide is the choice, except if they are Parkinsonian or bile obstructed. So that's very important. If they're not nauseated currently, but you need to prescribe something for the future, then you can always prescribe it as required, uh, 50 milligrams of cyclozine eight hourly, or um, the equivalent with metoclopramide. Pain relief. So this is a useful table. Um, generally, if someone's pain free, don't need to give anything. If they might need it as required, you can go up to one gram of paracetamol six hourly. Then if the pain is mild or severe, then you can start to step up the WHO pain ladder for codeine and um, stronger opiates. So here we have codeine and then regular, we have cocodamol for severe pain and then morphine, which you titrate up to 10 milligrams. Some people will say don't give 10 milligrams straight away because it might sedate the patient or put them into respiratory depression. So you could start with 2.5 to 5 milligrams depending on the patient's situation and titrate that up. <coughs> for neuropathic pain, just follow the ladder. 
Um, so remember, it starts with paracetamol, which is the first line thing, and then it goes up to gabapentin, pregabalin, amitriptyline, generally used less because of the anticholinergic side effects, and duloxetine. Um, hopefully it should give you some indication as to which one of these is needed. Um, if not, check the treatment summary for neuropathic pain. Tramadol, you want to avoid this with SSRIs. That is because of serotonin syndrome. So we want to watch out for that where someone is flushed and has uh, vomiting, nausea, gastrointestinal upset. So that's it for prescribers. Next, with PRN drugs, if it's to be used as required, you need to provide two instructions, the indication and the maximum frequency. So twice daily or total dose over 24 hours, for example. Common pitfalls from prescribing are solved by making sure that you follow that prescriber mnemonic. So consider things like thromboprophylaxis, fluids, antiemetics, and pain relief. And just always look for allergies too. For therapeutic effect, so aminophilin, I feel like I've spelled that wrong. There we go. Would measure O2 sats for the therapeutic effect, but you might measure um, serum theophylline or serum aminophilin for the toxic effect. So just check the, um, the phrasing of the question there. Finally, enzyme inducers and inhibitors. We want to look out for P450 inhibitors and inducers. The mnemonics that I use are sickfaces.com group and crap GPS. So for inhibitors, sickfaces.com, it's a bit of an awkward mnemonic because there are some letters that are shared between both mnemonics, but at least it gives you a kind of framework to hang these on. Um, so just look out for those. The G in group stands for grapefruit juice, which is interestingly a P450 inhibitor. Um, and may have a relation to, uh, may be related to the, the impact it has on breast cancer, for example, and metabolism of estrogen. So yeah, look out for those. If any of those are P450 inhibitors, that means that it would slow down and effectively raise the concentration of warfarin in someone's blood for longer. Whereas if it's an inducer, it'll cause them to um, metabolize warfarin faster, dropping their INR, and making them more pro-coagulant. Pro so look out for that. Um, there may be other drugs which it interacts with too. So in general, it'll be something that someone's on long-term and they're on one of these other drugs. If you see any of these, just basically make sure you have that light bulb moment and think, ah, this is P450. Now remember, is it an inducer or an inhibitor? And then just act accordingly. So dose adjustments. I shouldn't have brought a pint of tea with me before starting this video. So adjust the smallest increment that's been suggested by the BNF. That will always keep you safe. Remember, if you're measuring levels, you want to measure the trough level. That's generally the, the advice. Um, but if it's at the end of a five day course, um, and it would, okay, th this applies more for a written exam really, but um, you would just put a box around the date and write review and don't definitively stop something until you're absolutely sure that it's the end of the course for them or that you know the indication for the drug is no longer there. If you're changing medications, put a line through the old one. Again, this is more for um, written exam, but for steroids, if they someone is on long-term steroids and they have a sick day, just double the dose. So next, prescribing for surgery. In general, I think the rule of thumb is if you don't recognize the drug and there's no guidance on it, continue it. Always continue calcium channel blockers and beta blockers um, and even if they're nil by mouth you can still give them oral medications but ideally we want to switch to parenteral routes. Drugs to increase would be corticosteroids so that's because they won't be able to mount their natural um, corticosteroid response to an insult if they are already uh, if they're already on them so it can result in hypotension if you don't do that and uh, you can give IV during anesthesia as well. The drugs to stop, I use the acronym LAC, ILAC-OP, so I is insulin, L is lithium, A for anticoagulants and antiplatelets which you stop seven days before, C is COCP and HRT so you stop them four weeks before surgery, K is a potassium sparing diuretics and ACE inhibitors you stop on the day of surgery and then oral hypoglycemics. Some people will say you can continue. 
Others will say if the patient is nil by mouth, you can induce a lactic acidosis with that. So look out for any kind of indication that that might be the case. But in general, stopping someone's metformin for a day in terms of cost benefit, probably better to do that than it is to um, continue it and risk them going into lactic acidosis. Um, you can substitute with a sliding scale if it's a uh, multiple choice question, that could be one of the options, and so um, then that might be hinting you towards that. Perindopril, so not not great for the, because uh, it's not a very typical ACE inhibitor, but remember any other ACE inhibitors too um, that you would stop uh, on the day of the surgery. Main principle is that for things like anticoagulants, you want to avoid excessive bleeding, you want to avoid hypoglycemia and hypotension. Um, and then if someone is on warfarin and you need to optimize their INR, then uh, remember the, the general rules, which I'll cover in a second. Um, but you can reverse it if there's excessive bleeding, for example, with vitamin K. But yeah, I'll discover the specific, I'll discuss the specific numbers in a moment. You might see vitamin K noted down as phytomenadione. Just remember that's the same as vitamin K. If someone has renal impairment, but they need CT with contrast, you can give a bolus of saline to try and protect against that. Just another thing with surgery. Right, next we have antibiotics. Where did it go? <coughs> Include the indication for the antibiotics in the form if there is a field for it. And uh, for things like UTIs, you can give nitrofurantoin, but avoid it in renal dysfunction. Trimethoprim is, um, is okay, but remember to be aware of when this is teratogenic in pregnancy. I can't remember off the top of my head, I think it's the first trimester, but double check that in the PNF. Um, meningitis, you can give kefotaxim as the general, uh, general rule, but it will be It'll be in the treatment summary if you if you forget that. My mnemonic is just tax the meningitis for that. Um, neuro, neutropenic sepsis, you can give IV tazosin and uh, because oral antibiotics are not adequate for that. For antihypertensives, so just go through A, B, C, and D. ACE inhibitors. So remember this guideline for ACE inhibitors. That is, if someone is under fifty-five, start them on an ACE inhibitor. If they're over 55 or they're black of any age, start on a calcium channel blocker. Then if it's still uncontrolled hypertension, you go to step two, which is an ACE inhibitor and a calcium channel blocker together. And then if that's still uncontrolled, you add in a diuretic, usually a thiazide diuretic. And then if it's still resistant, then you can consider all of them plus beta blocker or a further diuretic. So side effects of antihypertensives or of ACE inhibitors, we cause sodium loss and potassium retention. So bear that in mind, we also cause hyperkalemia from, uh, from the potassium retention. A cough is possible, and also you want to look out for if the patient has a history of renal artery stenosis or renal impairment, then we wanna be careful with ACE inhibitor and maybe consider another option. Creatinine will transiently there we are. Trans transiently rise within 20... Uh, if it's within 20%, then you should ignore that and continue. If it's more than 20% from baseline, then consider stopping the drug. Also, you want to avoid in peripheral vascular disease because you may precipitate an ischemic limb. So examples would be lisinopril, perindopril, and ramipril, for example. Okay. In general, we want to avoid ACE inhibitors if the GFR is less than 30, and you can give at night um, because of postural hypotension. I can't remember if I've covered this somewhere else, but we may as well cover this now. If someone has heart failure, <coughs> ACE inhibitors do form part of that treatment, but there's a great mnemonic called unload fast. So sit them upright, give them nitrates, give them a loop diuretic, oxygen, ACE inhibitor, digoxin, and then restrict their fluids, careful of the um, afterload, rest restrict sodium, and uh, you can then include tests for digoxin level and potassium level as well. So unload fast is very useful for heart failure. ARBs, again, <coughs> 
These can once again cause hyperkalemia and um, they end in sartan, so low sartan for example. B for beta blockers, again avoid in peripheral vascular disease. C in hypertension for calcium channel blockers, these are things like verapamil, amlodipine, diltiazem and nifedipine. They have no effect on electrolytes, but they can cause leg swelling and flushing. Uh, avoid these in biventricular failure. Finally, diuretics. So you can have potassium sparing ones, which will obviously um, maintain or raise potassium level, or thiazide and loop diuretics, which will cause hypokalemia because they just shunt everything out of the uh, in, into the urine. So don't give two loop diuretics together. And if that's on someone's drug list, watch out for that. And it might say, which of these should you stop? And it'll be the second loop diuretic. Also, you want to monitor their weight. Um, so with monitoring requirements, they might say, what is the thing that you should monitor when someone's on, di on diuretics? And it's not actually potassium level or whatever. It might, it, if it's to monitor the um, effect of it, then it's weight. Okay, so prescribing in diabetes. If they are type 2, you start with metformin. You can move that up to, I think, 2 grams a day. Double check that in the BNF. And glyclozide if they are normal or underweight. Metformin if they are overweight. Also, if uh, creatinine is over 150, then you can use uh, glyclozide too. The main side effects and problems with glyclozide and sulfonyl ureas are weight gain, hypos, and uh, it says avoid in renal or liver impairment. I know that also the they say don't use metformin if you're in renal impairment, but um, what I've, from what I've been taught, it is metformin first, and then um, if that's contraindicated, you go for glyclozide. Check the um, contraindications in the BNF, and maybe may something specific to the patient that um, pushes you one way or another. Rare side effects would be SIADH, bone marrow suppression, liver damage, and peripheral neuropathy. So you take glyclozide in the morning so that you avoid overnight hypoglycemia. If someone does have hypoglycemia, then it depends on whether they are conscious and how severe it is. If they're conscious, you give oral glucose 10 to 20 grams first. If that's not possible and you have IV access, you can give IV glucose 20%, which is 100 mil. So it's the same dose of glucose, just given IV, it's 20% of 100 mil, would be 20 grams. It used to be that you would give like 50% glucose, but that's basically syrup. And I think the, the, the risk there was that you'd cause vascular damage from such high concentration of glucose there. So now it's 20%, 100 mil. For ulcerative colitis, you might be given a patient that has this. So if it's a flare and that is defined by more than six bowel movements and systemically unwell, then give IV hydrocortisone and fast fluids. If it's a mild flare, then you give oral prednisolone 30 milligrams over 24 hours. So rules on warfarin. Remember I said I would cover this. So the main thing is this actually. So if it's less than six, you reduce the warfarin. If the INR is between six and eight, omit warfarin for two days and then reduce the dose. And if it's more than eight, you omit warfarin and you give oral vitamin K. That should say vit K, not fit K. Um, and if there's minor bleeding alongside an INR of more than five, then you make the vitamin K IV instead. So here we have, um, if the INR is more than 1.5 perioperatively specifically, then you give five milligrams of oral vitamin K, even if their actual target is higher than that. Um, check if that guideline has been updated, but um, again, this is the process or the kind of flow chart for warfarin um, to the best of my knowledge. Avoid ibuprofen if someone's on warfarin, because uh, then if they have a stomach ulcer, they will also be at risk of a bleed. So if there's an alternative to ibuprofen that you can give or alternative to an NSAID, then that is the better approach. Warfarin is actually safe during pregnancy, but I think it's not during breastfeeding. Um, check the guidelines for breastfeeding in the BNF. If you're starting warfarin, remember warfarin is actually, ironic, it's counter, paradoxically, a uh, pro-coagulant in the first few days. So you bridge with low molecular weight heparin in the meantime because of that lag. 
um, and you start with a loading dose, you drop it gradually to a maintenance dose for INR monitoring, and if you need rapid anticoagulation, you load 10 milligrams for two days and then adjust according to the INR. If you're not given a range, assume plus minus 0.5. I'm not sure what I meant by that, I'm afraid. <coughs> Blood clot prophylaxis. So if someone has had a pulmonary embolism and you need to give prophylaxis for that, um, check the guideline for low molecular weight heparin. So it may be something like doltaparin for 5,000 units. Stop heparin if they are at risk of bleeding. So if they've had a recent ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, for example. Uh, you give it subcutaneously. And remember, if someone has peripheral arterial disease as well, you avoid compression stockings. Consider other drugs on their list that might be procoagulant, such as the oral contraceptive pill. That should be stopped. And then DOAX, look out for, so these are the direct oral anticoagulants, look out for anything that is um, something Zaban, uh, Rivaroxaban, for example, Apixaban. And XA is factor 10A. Pretty crazy. So um, there we go. Clots. So if someone's had a PE or a VTE that's active, you give a treatment dose of doltaparin. And for prophylaxis, you can give a pixaban orally if they have a phobia to needles, which was one of the questions we had on our paper. Unfortunately, anticoagulants and that kind of thing is really fiddly. It's fiddly to search for, it's fiddly to, to operate, um, and the actual guidelines are also quite fiddly in the BNF and Medicines Complete. So you just need to read it quite carefully if there's a an unusual situation going on. Be quite familiar with the DOAC section, the anticoagulant summary, and the oral anticoagulant summary as well. For NOAX, you want to consider the EGFR. And then for pain, this is the rule. I think we mentioned this before. Yes, we have. Um, consider nerve blocks for surgery, um, lidocaine as well, and uh, the equivalent doses are under the palliative care section. There's a table on the online one and also in the physical BNF too. For the oral contraceptive, remember, watch out for thrombus. So PE, DVT, anything that indicates that this person might be at risk of a clot or a stroke, and also of migraines, could be a potential cause of migraine. And if it says which of these drugs is likely to be the cause of this person's headaches, it'll be the contraceptive pill. So you take the missed pill rules are also really fiddly. This is kind of short term memory stuff that you just need to check before the exam. If they miss one pill, you take the missed one and then you continue. If you miss two pills, you take the last pill and then seven days additional. So you can take two in 24 hours if you missed one, for example. Um, check the check the guidelines again. It's it's in the BNF and it's a long paragraph of like, if this, then that. There's not really a clear flowchart, but again, just be familiar with it and know, you don't even have to memorize it. You just have to know where it is and where to look for. So yeah, some more on here. And then with the emergency contraceptive pill, this may be a question where if someone has had sex and they it was unprotected how long and how long do they have a window of until they can use the copper copper device uh to cancel the pregnancy and that would be five days and then the levonel pill which is the the morning after pill can be taken within 72 hours stop any kind of contraceptive pill six four to six weeks before surgery as well because of the procoagulant effect for HRT, remember you want to look up sex hormones in the BNF. If they have no uterus, you would use estrogen only um, with a marina coil to prevent endometrial proliferation, for example. Um, and if they have a uterus, then you can do cyclical estrogen or estrogen progesterone for, for days 12 to 14 for a bleed. Um, and then post-menopause, you can just give continuous combined um, contraception, uh, uh, HRT, um, because there's no there's no bleeding. They're past the actual menopause itself. 
So search the, the word menopause in the BNF as well and there'll be more on there. Again, this is such a fiddly topic and I think it's quite cruel to give you a question on um, sex hormones and uh, hormone replacement therapy. We did have one or two on, on our paper, so it certainly is possible. Unfortunately, I should say with the PSA in general, the kind of questions that come up can be very niche. We had one on um, like a picture of a rash on the inside of someone's mouth and then something about someone that had eye pain associated with malignancy that gave them a positional headache. Um, and it said, what drug do you prescribe? And it was dexamethasone. So these are all quite niche topics. They're not necessarily the bog standard stuff. So you won't be able to memorize all of this. It's just about being able to know what to look for and just doing that very quickly under the, the, the time constraints of the exam. We're almost there, guys. So fluids <coughs> for replacement, you generally, um, if they're hypovolemic, you get 500 mL saline over 15 minutes. And if they're hypoglycemic or hypernatremic, you can give 5% of glucose. And the amount depends on their body weight. So generally for replacement, um, you want to, well, you start with a bolus and then you see how dehydrated they are and that, that'll depend on, um, that'll dictate the dose. For maintenance, you want to check um, what their body weight is and then you calculate 25 to 30 mil per kilogram per day. So that's over 24 hours. If that's closer to three liters, then you give three eight hourly bags. If it's two liters a day, then you give two 12 hourly bags. Um, clinically as well, you wanna just check that their bladder's not distended, that it's not palpable, they've got no raised JVP, they've got no peripheral edema, they've got no crackles in their lungs, that just checking that they're not fluid overloaded before you bang more fluids in them. Maximum rate of potassium infusion, this is really important, no more than 10 millimoles per hour. If you give faster than that, you can precipitate a cardiac event. One millimole per kilogram of KCL and of NaCl. So um, if you're asked to include the additive of sodium or, or potassium, then um, that's, the, that's the rule. So if they're 80 kilograms, it's 80 millimoles of potassium and of sodium and of chloride. Maintenance, so the rule of thumb and unfortunately, fluids are very much bro science. Like it, it's just full of rules of thumb. There's not, um, there's not really a standardized fluid approach. I wish there was, and I think they're working towards doing one. Especially avoiding any of this nonsense about having like too sweet, one salty, and all this stuff. Like eventually, I think they're working towards having a single bag of just standard physiological fluid that has a nice ratio of glucose and sodium and everything to avoid going into keto into uh, ketosis and um, keeping the uh, electrolytes up to balance. But until that day comes, we have got to prescribe the bro science style. So that is one liter of sodium chloride, 0.9% with 20 millimoles of potassium over eight hours. And then follow that with two sweet. So 5% dextrose, 20 millimoles uh, potassium and repeat that again over the following eight hours, for example, if that's um, three liters a day. For resuscitation specifically, check the patient vignette um, and look out for things like diarrhea, syncope, vomiting, fluid intake, Addisonian crisis, fever, hypertension, um, drain, and excessive thirst. You start with a 500 mil of fluid of 0.9% bolus, um, if they have renal impairment or cardiac failure or they're frail or very small and you give 250 mils to start with, that's given over less than 15 minutes. You then reassess and repeat up to 2,000 mils, so two litres of resuscitation fluid. Once you've started to do that and it's not having any effect, then you want to really think like, hang on, maybe something else is going on. Maybe the fluid's being um, going into a third space or something. And then call for help. So if someone is shocked or they've been given two litres of fluid and it's still ongoing, they've got persistent hypovolemia, then there's there's obviously something else going on. And finally, once again, remember, don't give more than 10 millimoles of potassium per hour. Insulin, so it's subcutaneous, don't give it IV. Laxatives, there are many different types of laxatives. I remember this from the mnemonic BOSS, bulk forming, osmotic, stimulant and stool softening. Bulk forming are slow to work, osmotic, um, 
so you, you can't give it in a, in a rush. Osmotic ones are things like lactulose, increases uh, water in the bowel. Lactulose is also used for hepatic encephalopathy. So that's just a little fun fact that seems to always come up in the, in the PSA or have some marks dedicated to it. So just remember that. Stimulant laxatives, you do not give these in bowel obstruction because you're just stimulating the bowel to work more and it's obstructed, so you're gonna cause a big problem. These are things like Senna, so Senna, S for stimulant, sodium picosulfate and bisacadyl, and then stool softening laxatives are docusate. Um, so I think docusoft. Um, I think in kids you would stick with stool softeners or lactulose um, as a kind of second line thing after you've done dietary interventions, obviously. Um, and if someone already has a soft stool, just think don't give them a stool softener. Potassium. So if someone has hyperkalemia, the initial emergency treatment is 10 units of ActRapid, 100 mils of 20% dextrose, um, nebulized salbutamol, I think it's 10 milligrams or five, 5 milligrams, and uh, sorry, 5 milligrams, and calcium gluconate is 10 mils of 10%. I'm not confident on that, so... Um, again, double check the doses. I won't waste your time by looking that up now. Hypokalemia, dia. So um, these are drugs that cause hypokalemia. So diuretics, loop and thiazide. Remember, they just throw everything out. Inadequate intake or an intestinal loss. Renal tubular acidosis and um, endocrine causes such as Cushing's or Cons. For hyperkalemia, <coughs> the things that can cause it are dread. So diuretics, not loop ones, but these are ACE inhibitors and potassium sparing, obviously. Um, R for renal failure, E for endocrine, Addison's disease, A for artifact, and D for DKA. Common interactions, so look out for statins and macrolides together. Whoops, and where do we have care of the dying? Here, prescribe as required um, first for stuff with care of the dying. Remember that if someone's getting frequent injections to change that for a syringe driver, so to avoid um, frequently distressing the patient. If they have secretions, you give hyacin butyl bromide, 60 milligrams over 24 hours. If they have agitation, you give midazolam, 10 to 20 milligrams over 24 hours. Pain, 10 milligrams of... Uh, morphine over 24 hours and for nausea you can give cyclozine 150 milligrams over 24 hours so those are the key symptoms of dying so secretions agitation pain and nausea and if you just think in those terms and think okay what's the logical drug that i would give for those symptoms cardiovascular so myocardial infarction if someone has stable angina you can give gtn that's the the first line thing um, you can then also give um, you know what check the BNF for that because I've got a mnemonic but I think it's I think it might be shaky um, STEMI, Monat so morphine, oxygen, nitrates aspirin, and ticagrelor or clopidogrel um, so those are the drugs there those are the, uh, the doses as well and then if it's a STEMI they might give you an ECG in the paper. You would then do PCI within two hours. Plus, if there's no reperfusion therapy, you can give Fondaparinux, which is a low molecular weight heparin analog. For NSTEMI, you would give Monat as well, but the PCI window is longer, 24 to 48 hours if it's not contraindicated and it depends on the grace score risk. If you don't do that, then you can give Fondaparinux as well. For long-term treatment of a uh, myocardial infarction, you can do CRABS. <clears throat> which is clopidogrel, ramipril, aspirin, beta blocker, and statin. Heart failure. So we talked about the unload fast. This is very, very useful. Definitely worth learning that. Um, chronic heart failure, you can give an ACE inhibitor if it's not tolerated, or if they have asthma, you can give an ARB. Um, beta blocker is if they are congested, you give that chronically, you don't give it acutely, and then spironolactone or amelioride um, to help with um, offloading some of the fluid as well. 
Spironolactone can improve the prognosis, but actually furosemide doesn't, it improves the symptoms. And that distinction is something that also came up in the exam paper for us. For atrial fibrillation, if it's more than 48 hours, you do rate control. So give a beta blocker if they're in fast AF. Otherwise, the first line therapy for rate control is a rate limiting calcium channel blocker. So diltiazem or verapamil. And I think Vera and Dil, the, the sweet old ladies with AF and they're slow and old. Um, and you, if someone's asthmatic, you don't give beta blockers. If they've got fast AF and beta blockers are not allowed, then you can use digoxin. Generally, digoxin is used for someone with um, someone who's older because it affects your exercise tolerance. So, um, and it's got a narrower therapeutic window and it's generally more of a scary drug. For atrial fibrillation that's been occurring for less than 48 hours, you give amiodarone or flecainide. And I think Amy and Fleck, the crazy drummers that are, um, they're the, the rhythm guys. So um, you do that or cardiovert. Uh, which is DC cardioversion. These are chemical cardioverters. Chest x-ray is needed before treatment because it can cause interstitial lung disease or fibrosis of the lung. And you avoid these in structural heart disease. So check the guidelines for um, anything that you would do if, if that is the case. Generally, chemical or DC cardioversion has a high risk of thromboembolism because you're kicking something um, you're kicking the, the heart back into regular rhythm. And so if there has been a clot that's been sitting there for more than 48 hours, that's gonna get lodged somewhere. So um, you would anticoagulate someone if they've had AF for more than 48 hours, just in case that um, a clot is forming within the atrium. Okay, anaphylaxis. If someone has a wheeze, you give nebulized salbutamol and then 500 micrograms of one in a thousand adrenaline IM. That's half a mil of one in a thousand adrenaline intramuscular. Then you can give IV chlorphenamine, which is 10 milligrams IV, and uh, 200 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone. If someone has, has an asthma attack, use the mnemonic, oh shit me, which is O oxygen, H for hydrocortisone or prednisolone if unavailable, S for salbutamol, 2.5 to 5 milligrams, H for, oh sorry, that, that is the H, I for ipratropium, and then with senior input, you do TME, theophylline, magnesium sulfate, 2 grams, and then you escalate to a senior. Epilepsy, just know this and you'll be fine for epilepsy. In general, if someone has generalized seizures, or absence or myoclonic seizures, you can give valproate. Um, and then if they have tonic seizure, or tonic as well, if they have focal seizures, you can give carbamazepine or lamotrigine. All of these drugs are teratogenic to some degree, but it's about weighing up that alongside um, the effects of the epilepsy. So if someone's pregnant, generally you want to try and avoid valproate, which is the most teratogenic, um, but it's, it's always a, a weighing up of pros and cons. Monitoring drugs, so I will not run through this, but um, just try and uh, learn some of these or at least know how to look these up within the within the BNF. You do want to be familiar with the main organ or the main thing that each of these drugs affects. Um, usually it's kidneys, often it's liver as well, and that impact what you monitor, what you what you're looking for in the weekly um, or monthly measurements for blood tests. The main things to look out for are agranular cytosis, particularly with antipsychotics, creatine kinase with statins, and blood pressure with the oral contraceptive pill. Those are probably the most common ones. Also common side effects, same thing, you wanna try and learn um, as many of this as you can. So cyclozine, you've got the fluid retention, so avoiding heart failure. You might be given an option of someone who's nauseated and you have the option of giving them either cyclozine or metoclopramide. Um, and then you've got to say like, okay, well, they're in heart failure, so it's metoclopramide. Um, what else? Yeah, so morphine, we have urinary retention. Aspirin, you can 
you want to watch out for iron deficiency anemia, statins if someone's getting muscle pain, symptomatic um, muscle pain, or uh, raised creatine, ki creatine kinase, then that's something to watch out for. Anticholinergic drugs, um, so look out for delirium. Look out for serotonin syndrome with anything that might raise that, particularly uh, combining tramadol with something else that might raise serotonin, like an SSRI. Tamoxifen can cause a VTE, so anything that impacts estrogen, and uh, omeprazole increases the risk of C. diff. Okay, for calculations, these are just a case of doing lots of practice with drug dose calculations. Remember though, a 1% solution contains 1 gram in 100 ml, because 100 ml is 100 cubic centimeters of water, each cubic centimeter of water weighs a gram, so there is one gram in 100 ml. One in a thousand means one gram in a thousand ml. That becomes the new concentration. But then if you have 1% of one in a thousand, that's 1% of that, which is 0.01%. So just be aware of that because they may try and throw you off with some questions about uh, percentages of fractions. Oxygen. So in general, I don't think there was an oxygen prescribing question in our paper, but these are the general rules. You don't want to be pushing people to 100% oxygen. In normal patients, you're looking for between 94 to 98%. Um, and if they start to go hypercarbic, so type 2 respiratory failure, then you want to drop that a little bit and also consider that they might have COPD and consider senior review as well. And that's about it, really. Um, there might be something about the indications for non-invasive ventilation. Um, these are worth looking into, but don't get too bogged down because the guidelines for um, the British Thoracic Society are massive. Okay, almost done. Blood and transfusions. So if someone's very hypotensive, you give fluids first. So you give the resuscitation bolus of fluids first, then you consider the blood transfusions. If someone is iron deficient, um, then you transfuse if they're severely symptomatic, i.e they're getting problems and they can't, you know, maybe angina and they can't wait for the effect of the iron replacement to kick in, or if their haemoglobin is less than 70 grams per litre. Oral iron is given until haemoglobin is normal and then three months thereafter as well. For alcohol, if someone's going through a um, acute withdrawal, such as delirium tremens, you can give chlordiaz epoxide, and if they've been heavy drinking, and there's something that indicates their nutritional status is affected, you can give thiamine or Pabrinex or your vitamin B, C complex. Right, that is it. So um, some summaries that are worth looking at within the treatment summaries are um, antipsychotics and acute dystonic reactions. You would give procyclidine for that. Look out for neuro neuroleptic malignant syndrome just be aware of some of the clinical presentations of that. Um, what is the effect of anticholinergic excess? So the the technique that people have used is mad, red, dry, and blind. Um, so if you see those things together, think maybe it's anticholinergic excess. It might say which drug is responsible for this problem. Um, and that can be caused by amitriptyline, particularly the most common one. Um, set Serotonin syndrome, so again, mad, red, wet, and dilated pupils, so watch out for SSRIs and SNRIs, um, and things like tramadol, T uh, tricyclic antidepressants, um, and then alcohol, we touched on that, so Wernicke's encephalopathy, you give Pabrinex, um, which is the, the vitamin replacement. If they have withdrawal and delirium tremens, you give Claudia's apoxide first, and to prevent relapse and... Um, the anti-addictive properties is a acamprosate. Hepatic encephalopathy, give lactulose, and remember that the, the dose equivalence of um, steroids as well, so five milligrams prednisolone is equivalent to 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone. Okay, there is a quick run through of the prescribing skills assessment. I hope that was useful. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. I hope this helps you with your PSA just remember 
do some prep for this, give it at least five, six weeks. Hopefully you're not watching this like the night before the exam and um, just respect the paper. Best of luck. Let me know how you get on. Speak to you soon.